Welcome, old and new friends, to our Wednesday evening Q&A live stream. Uh, I'd like to invite people to type in questions to the chat that they would like to discuss or any topics. Before we get into anything, um, I did want to touch on a recent, very interesting summary of the essential aspects of mindfulness I came across. Um, Jana Ponika, uh, Tara, put them together and I found them very powerful. I think they were called um, the fountains of power of mindfulness and they include um, four functions of sati. Tidying up by naming, non-coercive procedure, stopping and slowing down, and directness of vision. And I came across these in the context of several sources um, or several different essential aspects of mindfulness, but those four very much stood out to me. Um, I've never quite heard such a good rundown of, of these particular uses of mindfulness. Uh, tidying up by naming, I find to be a very useful one to think about. I've said before that Aya Ananda Bodhi um, spoke about the first years of her practice of mindfulness of breathing being mostly mindfulness of mind in that much of the time was taken up by simply her labeling and understanding what hindrance was taking her away from the meditation object. And I've found there's a real power to when a certain hindrance is obsessing you, realizing which one it is and just understanding that um, and labeling it and putting it in its proper place. Uh, Ajahn Jayasaro points out that meditation isn't just making the mind calm through application of a technique. It's developing a life skill. Um, and it's a bit akin to going into a zoo and watching you know, these wild animals in a tame, contained environment so that when you encounter one of them, if you ever did in a non-contained environment outside of the zoo, or when you encounter one of these defilements outside of meditation, you know a bit what to do with it, how to interact, what it is. And so just this function of meditation as um, a place where one can encounter and see more clearly into the hindrances that dominate our lives and mental patterns is a really useful way of looking at meditation because sometimes then um, when the mind is wild or filled with sensual craving, aversion, sloth, doubt, restlessness, and remorse, we no longer have to dismiss the sit as a wasted half hour. Rather, we can understand that we're gaining some insight, some clarity, however difficult it is to earn that acquaintance with that particular hindrance, um, however painful, however long it takes. Um, it's invaluable because those same patterns that affect how you hold the breath generally are the patterns that affect how you hold um, the loved one, the career, the life, yourself. The small patterns manifest on the large scale. Some of my most uh, meaningful insights were just that understanding, seeing how a simple way of interacting with my meditation object was actually how I interacted with something much, much bigger in my life and how every movement towards wisdom um, with regards to those specific hindrances and every slight alteration or softening of that patterning rippled out into my life as a whole. So that all goes to say, um, I think that's a very useful way of looking at meditation and it's a very useful 
uh, pointing to an aspect of mindfulness as tidying up by naming, naming the hindrance or the enlightenment factor. The other three deserve going into as well, but I think we should move into questions. But just to lay them out one more time, those four fountains of power of mindfulness by Nyanaponika Tara are tidying up by naming, non-coercive procedure. That's a very interesting one. Um, stopping and slowing down. And the fourth is directness of vision. Hello, Venerable. Can you give some guidance on what is meant by picking up the sign of the mind? Is this necessary to establish mindfulness of the mind as specified in the Satipatthana? Thank you. I don't completely know the phrase you're referring to of picking up the sign of the mind. Sign is usually translated in Pali as nimitta. And so chitta is mind. So chitta nimitta, that certainly could be a phrase in the suttas. What you could be maybe referring to is in the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing, the step where one breathes in and out and becomes sensitive to the mind. That's the ninth step out of 16. The, and it is the beginning of the four steps that correlate to mindfulness of mind. The standard definition of mindfulness of mind in the Satipatthana Sutta, mindful, the foundations of mindfulness, is one sees a, a mind affected by greed as affected by greed a mind affected by aversion as affected by aversion, delusion by delusion, a contracted mind as contracted mind, a distracted mind as a distracted mind. Um, so that's restlessness and remorse, doubt. Um, and then it goes into a series of sort of seeing very positive qualities of the mind, seeing the mind as exalted, surpassed, concentrated, liberated, or their opposites. What I've heard those referred to as a bit of uh, something a bit simpler, a bit like the mental tone, um, the mood almost. And I think it's very useful because you um, move from the second foundation of mindfulness, found mindfulness of feelings into mindfulness of mind. And sometimes you go into a day and say, there's just Everything is strike hitting badly. The um, you know the person at work annoys you. Traffic is bad. You can't stop thinking about an argument. And each of those is a feeling. You know this negative mental tone, this negative mental sankara. There's a refinement when you that sort of insight when you're like, oh, of course, all of these individual mental feeling events, mindfulness of feelings. Um, are manifesting because what's in the background is this overwhelming mood of aversion. And for me, that's a bit of the jump to mindfulness of mind. You're seeing the mood behind it. Another way of putting it is you're turning off the, you're recognizing that if a movie is playing on the projector of the movie screen of your mind, then if the canvas upon which the movie is projected is warped or stained, then everything, every image, every narrative, every experience of that day of that movie will be warped in a similar way. So there's a good insight in just being like, oh, I see now the pattern behind all these mental events and impressions is a general mood of blank. I think it can get more refined though. Um, that's a fairly coarse way of becoming sensitive to the mind. In meditation, when things become calm and you cultivate a fairly unified object, say of 
the sound of silence, um, a perception of light, a, or even, um, you know, in the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing Sutta, that point where um, mental impressions and thoughts just begin to fade. And there's a sense of sukha, pleasure, um, or a broad, bright awareness. Um, and the steps preceding becoming sensitive to the mind, picking up the sign of the mind in the Anapanasati Sutta is becoming sensitive and calming, citta sankara, which is mental activity, mental formations, um, thoughts and feelings, perceptions and feelings. So what I've always taken that as is when the meditation gets calm, there does come a point where those individual thoughts feel coarse and um, they start to come less. You let go of these sort of residual perceptions, say of the frame of the body, how you're holding the body. Um, and it can be very disorienting at first, but if you maintain a careful continuous awareness, either with the breath or with a broad awareness of the whole breath body, the energetic body, um, or of say a broad awareness of metta, um, perception of light, um, the nada sound, then those all those chitta sankara, that mental activity fades and you're left with just the movie screen. It's like you've stopped the projector and suddenly you just get to see the movie screen. And that's picking up the sign of the mind. You're seeing the backdrop, the sort of substrate more so, or a deeper level. And what's very interesting is the following steps in the Anapanasati Sutta is one gladdens the mind, concentrates the mind, and liberates the mind. So what I find very interesting there is when the mind has become that calm and malleable, generally there's a sense of brightness. Uh, awareness will usually rise in the body um, to, for me, around the heart up to above the head. It'll become broad and wide. It's no longer constricted by the frame of the body. Um, it's very malleable. So that's when you can drop in a perception of metta, just a thought, love, and it'll spread out and permeate the mind. So you have a chance to affect the mind. It's a bit like you're going up to that movie projector screen and you get a chance to sort of um, sweep away all the wrinkles and creases in the movie projector um, screen. And that's the power of those calm states is you can really affect the quality of the mind because you're seeing it free of all of the projections, the mental sankara. So that's one way you could look at that question, I suppose. Oh, good. Ian uh, highly recommends everything and anything by Nyana Ponika Terra. I have not read as much as I wish or wish I had. Angela, um, I'm wondering which defilement does work stress come from and how do we overcome it? It's a great question. Hmm. Different lists the Buddha gives are useful at different times. Um, so if you do look at the suffering, I mean, the source of all suffering and stress is craving at the end of the day. Um, if you want to look at it in terms of the defilements, greed, hatred, and delu delusion, the kilesa, um, that can be useful and there may be something to that. I don't find those categories especially line up with the experience of work at uh, stress at work. What I have found is, um, and this is the thing is you have to find which lists to apply at which times the Buddha gives this enormous set of tools. 
one that I found very useful with uh, anger and stress is the um, foundations of upadana or attachment. So the Buddha lays out four attachment to uh, sensual craving, attachment to self view, attachment to um, uh, rites and rituals, and attachment to views generally. Attachment to self view. I think attachment to conceit. Anyway, something like self view, sorry, upadana. So what I found useful there is when, say, in work, something is coming up that's prevent, you know, bringing up stress, seeing which one of those sources of attachment and craving is being compromised or challenged or threatened. I find that to be a very, a more useful paradigm in many cases. And it's an interesting one because I'd, um, I hadn't heard many people talk about it. So I've used this example before. If you're in the food line, say at a monastery, and some junior monk cuts in front of you and takes whatever food you know you were looking at, is your reaction of aversion due to them challenging your attachment to sensual desire because you wanted that food item? Is it due to your to them challenging? your attachment um, to uh, rites and rituals, saying, I'm the senior monk. This isn't how we do things here. They're junior. How could they? This isn't how the system works. Is it due to uh, t them challenging your uh, attachment to your self-view, um, saying like, you know, of course they don't respect me. No one ever respects me. Um, this is just like that one time back in childhood or is it due to them challenging views, um, your views, which is uh, something perhaps like um, this person is always like this, uh, you know, they never can uh, just fall into line like they're supposed to. What's the world coming to? Um, everything's falling apart. So just to say, I think a lot of uh, work uh, workplace mishap and friction, that's an interesting and I think underutilized uh, set of categories the Buddha gives. The other, you know, but also I think it works so often a lot of, uh, a lot of stress just comes from having, um, so much ambition goes into work, the need for promotion, the need to make, you know, uh, a difference to make um, progress. Uh, that's bhava tanha, uh, craving to become. And when craving to become is compromised or challenged, it will lead to stress and dukkha. Um, it's a source of craving. And I just think with work often, that's the place to look. Um, that source of craving and if that's being challenged and can one hold bhava tanha more lightly can you see the suffering inherent in that and more and more um take work on its own terms um realize its limitations and pour your ambition into something reliable like the dhamma um it's the beautiful thing about practice is this path is open and available and um, it's just a much safer route to pour your heart into than work. Um, it's not perfect because the Dhamma exists within a social framework of Sangha, of monasteries, of sitting groups, and all of those have the Kilesa tied up into them like anywhere else, um, but it is more reliable and for those who've stepped into monasteries, who've begun to cultivate Kalyana Mitta with spiritual friends who hold the five precepts, you know instinctively, intuitively, um, somatically even, like you can feel it, the safety that comes with being with others who share that level of morality and who aren't with you because of your personality necessarily, but because you share a common goal. 
it's a much more firm foundation. Hello, Malika from Australia. No question, but thanks for the pointer, <laughs> definitely. What is the Theravada Buddhist view on privacy in the age of big data? Well, I've, I have no answer to that, <laughs> I think. I don't know if we have a view. Um, Yeah, I don't think we have a view on that one necessarily. Um, I would say, um, if any of you have read much Yuval Harari uh, in his, I think it's called 21 Questions for the 21st Century, um, he finishes this book on how algorithms are beginning to know us so that they can hack us by saying, it's his final chapter is, I think, titled Meditate. And his basic admonition at the end of that book is, if we are to stop the algorithms and the companies and the big tech from controlling our actions and hacking us, we have to hack ourselves first. And that's what meditation is for. So if you know yourself, if you can see your impulses and center, you um, aren't as vulnerable. I think that's very true. I think much of the culture wars now, much of the political polarization, um, on both sides is due to suddenly having our canopies of meaning swept away, our uh, ways of confronting suffering, because there's a part of the human spirit which needs um, religious language and not with a big R necessarily, but some language commensurate to the task of speaking to and confronting suffering and transcendence. And if we get rid of every way of talking about those things and embodying them, then that part of the spirit becomes entranced with ideologies and polarized, polarized causes. And ideologies are a bit like crippled religions. They limp along, they provide some sense of purpose and um, community, but they lack the richness of a tradition. And this, I think, is where Buddhism is so helpful, is it gives us a canopy of meaning that is palatable to the modern mind, that is practicable in its admonition to meditate daily, here's how you do it. And it's straight to the point. It speaks about, it's just the Four Noble Truths, here's your suffering, here's peace. And those are the two essential aspects of religious framework, religious language. However allergic people are to that word, um, I don't quite know how to speak to it apart from maybe the sacred. Um, but Buddhism can provide that. And that's quite a relief because it means that instead of necessarily having to wade straight into the political realm, not that we can't interact with that and social change in a skillful way, but um, you can also have faith that if you're practicing, if you're embodying this Buddhist path and thereby setting an example where it will spread, you're, I think, addressing the fundamental um, hunger that is giving rise to that political pol polarization. I think that's related to the age of privacy. Um, social media and algorithms are very much related with um, whipping society into a frenzy. So meditate. Is reoccurring depression an obstacle in the path or a useful teacher along it? I know one quote by a psychologist who said, can you not look at depression as a fist crushing you into the ground, 
but as a palm pressing you down onto solid ground. I think much of depression can be that. It's the seeing through all the illusion. And when one sees through quite rightly with wisdom, the shallow goals held up to us by our society and our upbringing, the trivial things we've given our life to, depression's somewhat inevitable. The trick is that if you turn towards and have an intuition of a path out of suffering, then there's something to replace everything that has been torn down. So what was just depression becomes chanda, spiritual zeal. It becomes urgency. It becomes a term we call samwega, which in Pali is, uh, it's related to vega, which means wave, and sang is a um, intensifier. So it's a wave sweeping over one. And it's composed of three elements, alienation from what one had formerly given their heart to, a sense of chastisement um, over our complicity in the foolishness, and a sense of urgency to find something outside of that, uh, the spiritual search, Arya Pariyasana. And the issue, I think one of the reasons depression is so prominent in our culture right now, I think 65% of college students in the late 2000 teens said that they were almost too depressed to function uh, much of the time is because people are seeing through the veneer, but haven't yet necessarily found the path out. So, you know, it's, it's Plato's prisoner realizing that everything they've been looking at is shadow on the wall. The trick is the Buddha is trying to gently nudge our faces towards the doorway and it's brimming light. And if you don't have that nudge or that intuition or that moment of grace, then what can your eyes do but glaze over and look at the sandy floor of the cave, you know, to continue the metaphor. I think a lot of depression is that. And in that sense, it can be a tool on the path if held with wisdom. But also um, some people have uh, powerful mental, um, you know, chemical imbalances. Some of them have deep trauma from the past, um, societal and more. And um, that can be difficult. I don't know if I'd say it's necessarily a hindrance to the path. The Buddha laid out four kinds of kama. You have bright kama, which is good, you know, karma leading to um, uh, desirable results in the realm of acquisition is what it's called, you know, wealth, pleasure. Um, dark karma, which is, you know, bad, quote unquote, karma leading to undesirable results in the wealth realm of acquisition, negative feeling, loss, um, poverty, uh, things like that. Um, then you have neither bright nor dark, both bright and dark, which is, you know, a mixture, which is where most of us land. And then you have neither bright nor dark, which is transcendent comma leading to the end of comma. And I think all the other comma, I mean, deep depression could be thought of as, you know, it, it's a difficult condition to live with, surely. And, and I, I've had some depression, but I can't speak to the deeper realms of that with people. And I don't pretend to, um, but all conditions in a life, the key element is always that fourth type of comma, because if one has mindfulness and the eightfold path, the transcendent eightfold path um, leading to the end of suffering, then every condition is a tool of awakening, no matter how difficult, no matter how pleasant. So, you read the life of Shu Yun, this uh, amazing bodhisattva in China, 
and it is filled with him um, nearly dying continuously, being beaten to death, three, nearly to death three times by malice thugs, um, burning off his finger. That was his own decision. Um, and yet, because he was practicing, everything became a tool for awakening. So really, you know, you have to work with the conditions you're in. And surely there are states of depression, which are very much worth getting treated with medicine. Um, I've taken antidepressants as a layman. Um, I think they're really useful in certain situations and probably not useful in others. Um, but uh, to have, to understand that all conditions can be tools for awakening and even the best conditions can be tools for delusion. Um, many people, you know, the Deva realms, the heavenly realms are considered very easy to become careless in and to lose oneself in, in the Buddhist conception. So uh, the world is falling apart in its eagerness to reveal what lies underneath. I think of it that way sometimes. But someone, uh, if you are suffering with deep depression, meditation alone may not always be enough. Getting counseling um, help is essential for some people. Okay. Alienation, chastisement, urgency. Thank you for that elucidation. So yes, once again, that's the term samvega uh, being elaborated upon. And those three, um, that rundown, those three aspects are Tanasar Bhikkhus, Ajahn Jest, as so many things are. He's just a genius. Um, it's interesting. Samvega is just, it's frequently translated as spiritual urgency but it, it's really impossible to translate. Um, and yet those moments of Samwega, it, it's illustrated in the suttas by a story often. Um, there's a noble man named Venerable Yasa. His name's not Yasa, uh, it's just Yasa at the time, I believe, or I can't remember if his lay name changes. He ends up as Venerable Yasa. And he his, he's a wealthy aristocrat. He falls asleep to a bunch of a party and he wakes up and looks around and sees all the dancers sleeping on the floor and he just sees them as so many corpses. And he runs away from the house and runs into the Buddha and the Buddha says, Sit, you know, here's peaceful and teaches him and he ordains and gains a level of awakening. That's some Vega, that moment. And I, I just find it to be the most beautiful moment, um, however it manifests. Uh, you just see it come at the strangest times. Um, I spoke recently to someone who had been listening to an Ajahn Amaro talk. And at the very end, or at some place in it, he says, the Lord Buddha, uh, he's speaking about the different uh, analogies for the khandas, the body, a lump of foam, the uh, feeling is uh, a water droplet uh, after sort of a, a, dro uh, a droplet of water. Is, is something's dropped in water, the droplet of water that comes up. Um, the uh, perception as a mirage, Sankara as a plantain tree, and consciousness as a magician. And at the end, he says, the Lord Buddha has given you these teachings to release the grip of your fist around these khandas. And um, that moment was this turning point for her where everything changed. And um, I remember the moment of grace in my life uh, of Samwega. There was a few, uh, but one was reading Siddhartha and seeing the image of the Buddha in it. And another was... Um, when I followed a monk for the first time on alms round. And this is perhaps what those three terms don't touch because urgency doesn't indicate also the sense of faith and grace that come with this so often. It, the Christians call them moments of grace. And for me, every one of those major moments in my life had the sense of golden light of stepping into a footprint that was made for you. And um, 
I think steering your life by those moments is all we can do. I think that will be a good topic of discussion for the Zoom. We can talk about our moments of grace. And if you want to hear some other good ones, look at the recent community stories uh, session on our YouTube from last Saturday. We had three young people talk about their moments of grace. It was quite powerful. So now we have our weekly Zoom session, 6.45 to 7.30. I'll paste the link uh, into the chat. You can also go to clearmountainmonastery.org and halfway down the page, you will see a link to our Zoom session. Until then, I wish everyone here uh, grace and peace, and we'll hope to see you soon. We're having Ajahn Kovilo come uh, soon, Jen, June 2nd, he'll be in Seattle. So we'll have two months with him. Be well. <laughs>